But like, if you look at the pollings, I mean, support for gun control didn't exact, didn't the, the, the increase for it, didn't actually sustain over the ensuing months after Parkland. Uh, what did seem to change is that there's now like an engaged side on the gun control issue, like uh, on the on the left, on in particular, there's more attention going to this issue than there was before. So if you talk to like researchers about this, there was like this intensity gap between the right and left on this issue. writer for Vox since its founding in 2014 with a particular focus on criminal justice issues and guns and legislation and policy around those. Um, before that he worked at City Beak, City Beak which is a local paper in his native Cincinnati covering politics and policy at the local and state level. Um, so actually I thought we'd start by bringing those two together um, Herman has a, has a very interesting post on Vox this morning about the potential impact that next week's elections might have on criminal justice in all sorts of areas. So I know there are recent events looking back that we're going to want to talk about. I thought um, though we might start by looking forward at what's at stake and what are some of the most interesting things we should be watching for, not just in outcomes of, of races and candidates, but uh, some of the most important ballot initiatives on different states. Sure, so I think there's a lot of ballot initiatives this year that are particularly interesting if you're, in, if you're focused on guns and criminal justice issues and gun violence in general. Um, some of them do have to do, like uh, Washington is doing one on, on gun control measures that, like, uh, that, that, that will, that's definitely one to watch because it's, um, it's like a progressive state, but it's still been doing a lot of work through ballot initiatives because the legislature has been resistant to doing a bunch of gun control measures. Um, but there's also a lot of interesting stuff in terms of into the drug policy space, like there's a drug defelonization to like make drug possession not a felony but a misdemeanor in Ohio. Um, and it would be one of, it would be the sixth state to do this. Like, and mostly liberal, like coast, coastal states have done this so far. So I, I think that's interesting. There's also a bunch of, stuff regarding uh, like pros there's prosecutors elections, there's uh, attorneys general elections. These are like also important for the criminal justice system but don't get as much attention uh, as, they, as they deserve in my opinion. Um, uh, but I, I think in general it, the, the theme I would say is like people should like look at their local races more seriously because like this is where the criminal justice system really happens. Like this is the local and state level. And this is like relevant to our topic today is where a lot of like gun violence prevention stuff happens. Not just in terms of gun control, but like police, basic police work and prosecuting work and all that that does address gun issues. Um, don't get as much attention as like say, like gun, gun control measures at the federal level, but they deserve more attention. And yet we've seen, and you've written about, you know, how is it that a place like Chicago can be a, a a city with strict gun control laws that still has this, you know, incredibly uh, high homicide rate and rate of gun violence that speaks to however many measures are occurring locally that they they don't represent the kind of solutions that are going to move numbers like that. Right. I mean, like, it, I think if you look at it like, uh, like you can look at it from Massachusetts' perspective even. Like, Massachusetts has some of the strongest gun laws in the country. Um, like that they have this permit to purchase system where police chiefs can tell people even if they're not in direct violation like they don't have a specific thing on their criminal record or mental health record police chiefs if they think like this person has a troubling history here might not be technically illegal what he did before but it like troubles me I will deny him a permit to buy a gun so like you have to go through this like permit to purchase system and then you have to go through background checks and then even then like there are there are other checks like there are multiple background checks in place because the state also does its own background check in Massachusetts. But if you go to New Hampshire, um, they don't have any of this. Uh, I mean, like they they have the federal background check system in place, but otherwise, you can first of all there are loopholes around that. So if, like you are doing a private transfer with say like a parent giving a their gun to a child, like there there doesn't have to be a background check for that. And that lets people obtain guns that maybe they shouldn't have, 
And then they can take those guns and bring them over here. So we see that in Chicago quite often. And they, people go to Indiana, they buy guns, come back to Chicago. And it's illegal to do this, to be clear. But like, there's no way to, for a reliable way for police to catch this when, when somebody's just going to Indiana, buying a gun, there's no like, documentation for it, and then going back to Chicago. It's the, sa the same kind of thing plays all, takes place all over the country. We see it here in Massachusetts with uh, New Hampshire and southern states. There's also like the Iron Pipeline is what it's called. Um, and that, that's, that's just a, a big problem. It's like no matter how much local and state governments do about guns in particular, in terms of gun control legislation, there are limits to how much they can do there. Because other states do have laxer gun laws and those guns do end up over, over here. Uh, one of the, the patterns we're seeing is, is a general trend towards less incarceration, less punitive measures. I was fascinated by um, one of the ballot initiatives, I don't remember if it's Florida or where, that what happens if you change uh, laws around marijuana, for instance, to people who are currently serving time for marijuana possession? And I think, you know, in Canada, Justin Trudeau has gotten a lot of blowback about if, if things that used to be illegal become legal, what happens to, what should the retroactive responses be? Right. So how, how many states are looking at measures that would not only change the law going forward, but have an impact on their incarcerated communities too? So on, on marijuana legalization issues, this has become a major top point because like most of the ballot initiatives so far have not actually been retroactive. So like even though Colorado legalized marijuana, like people in prison for or jail for marijuana, which isn't that many. But it, but the people who are there for those offenses, there's no like retroactive expungement or, or whatnot. California did this, though, that they, they are looking back at people's records. And it's important here that they're not just like get, taking people out of prison, but also expunging their criminal records, because like those are the like that's, that can affect somebody's ability to get a job and, and whatnot, and like that, that perpetuates. Like if somebody's in a bad place in their life and they sell marijuana to someone, they get caught by police it's going to be really difficult once they have that criminal record to get a legitimate job. So chances are they're going to go back to that same activity that got them in trouble in the first place. So like we've seen, we are seeing that, um, that some states are starting to consider those measures where it's like retroactive. California is not considered, like if you talk to marijuana legalization activists, they call it the gold standard because of that. And that's something more states I think are, are looking to when it comes to like criminal justice reform in general. And how much of this is, is motivated by state budget concerns as opposed to pure issues of, of justice and evolving legal norms and social norms? So definitely in conservative states it started as a budget issue. I don't, I don't think there's like much debate about that. Um, like in, I, I'm from Ohio, so I was familiar with the criminal justice reform stuff there. And like really like the governor, John Kasich, and the legislature were really focused on like our prison budget is just completely out of control and it's cutting back on our schools. Um, but over time, it's kind of like turned more into like these people have actually started to talk to criminal justice reformers on the left, and they've like begun to understand their side of the argument. And I think in that way, they've become more attuned to like treating this as like a not just a budget issue, but a civil rights issue as well. So um, we're still um, watching funerals and vigils for the victims of the shooting in Pittsburgh, and. Um, I think many of us had this, you know, in addition to just the horror, the reaction was the horror at the response, which now has this awful familiarity, like its own kind of bell that tolls. You have one of these horrible incidents, you have the same political responses or lack of responses, the same media responses, and then maybe something is proposed legislatively, but it doesn't go anywhere, and then we move on and wait for the next massacre. And was, was anything different about Pittsburgh? Did we learn anything? Do you, what do you see it taking to, to change that recurring pattern? I honestly don't have an answer for that in terms of like how we change that. I think in terms of like whether Pittsburgh is different, I'm honestly not sure. I think it's just too early to tell. I think there is a sense that like Parkland was different earlier this year. But like, if you look at the pollings, I mean, support for gun control didn't exact, didn't the, the, the increase for it didn't actually sustain over the ensuing months after Parkland. Uh, what did seem to change is that there's now like an engaged side on the gun control issue, 
like uh, on the on the left, on in particular, there's more attention going to this issue than there was before. So if you talk to like researchers about this, there was like this intensity gap between the right and left on this issue, where there it's always been the case that a majority of Americans think, well not always, but like generally in the past few years, the majority of Americans support strengthening gun laws. The problem has been that like voters who prefer stronger gun laws were not voting on that issue specifically. Whereas if you think of like the stereotypical NRA member, he was definitely voting on this issue. And like that intensity gap has driven a lot of this discussion. So even though most Americans support stronger gun laws, when politicians started considering these, uh, this kind of legislation, they got calls mostly from like somebody who you would consider like a, a member of the NRA or some other gun rights group. And that might have started to change with Parkland. I, I mean, like these kids seem to have like really made this issue. And you see this in polling, particularly youth voters are putting like gun violence higher on their list as a priority issue, which is different from what we saw in the past few years. So I think that's like where we might see start to see an impact. But I think it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a lame answer, but it's, I think it's too early to say yet whether how, how, how sustainable that is. Well, the Florida did, in the wake of Parkland, pass legislation that had not been able to get through the Florida legislature before that. I mean, are, do you see other measurable? I guess what was fascinating is that you, in the same year as Parkland, we had the Las Vegas shooting, which was the worst in history. Um, and that did not change the trajectory, and for that matter, you know, Newtown, which, you know, may be the most unimaginably awful scene of mass shooting as well, didn't change. What do you think was different about Parkland that you didn't see a closing of the enthusiasm gap, the motivation gap, the energy on two sides around some of those other incidents? I think it's because it was the specific victims, and particularly these teenagers, who got incredibly active almost immediately after the shooting. So there were like reasons this couldn't happen before. Um, I think like like with Sandy Hook, I mean it was like an elementary school. A lot of the victims were like little toddlers. So like obviously the the people who survived that are not going to be politically active. They're toddlers. Well, their parents became yeah, very politically but, active. but they became politically active. But like they mostly they just weren't as loud, right? Like back then, like you saw you saw them push the state legislature. But like they didn't hold a march for our lives. Do you think they didn't know how to be as loud? I wonder to what extent it took. It takes a generation that is most digitally native that understands a different kind of organizing and mobilization because of technology use that was not the case of other sets of. How much was that? I think that's that's definitely part of it. I mean, like those, they were immediately active on Twitter, right? And a lot of journalists are on Twitter, so they're gonna like to share those stories. But it's also that, like, I think because they are teenagers, like one of their very early messages was like, "You're the adult in the room. Fix this." And I think that's just like a really compelling message. Like we see these teenagers, and we think they're innocent. They should be like, like they shouldn't have to be involved in this area. It should be adults dealing with this. I mean, like, a lot of them couldn't even vote yet. So, like, it, it, it's, I think that built initial sympathy for them and made it easier for them to launch the movement in a way that maybe the, the parents couldn't. I mean, it, in some ways, it's, it's hard to explain this because, like, we're still talking about, like, the federal government failing to take action after an elementary school was, like, saw a horrible tragedy. But I think it, it once you start, like, peeling back, like, how these kids, these teenagers got active immediately after um, and how they engaged on social media and, and just the sympathy built around the fact that they are underage, technically children, uh, really drove a lot of support for them. Yeah, I think when, when you look at some of the statistics about gun ownership and you see that there are 120 guns for every 100 uh, right. people in the United States, it, it's easy to imagine that, that like, every single household has at least one gun. That's, that's not actually the case. And I think there, are, there may be a lot of misunderstanding and misconception about um, where, where guns are, who has them, and why. And I, and I wonder how much that distorts both the political 
and policy debate and the cultural debate. Can you walk us through some of the, the, the mythology and the misunderstanding around? Sure, so I mean like it is, def it is true, that, like based on the best estimates we have, that uh, like for every 100 people in the US, there are 120 guns, but those guns are concentrated in like a few households by and large. If you actually look at like surveys, like do you have a gun in your household, it's like something like 30 to 40 percent, depending on which survey you look at, people have a gun. Um, and then like some of those, like if you, if you go dig in deeper, then we're talking about like some households with 10, 100 plus guns. So like that's, that skews the numbers overall. Um, and I, I think what's important there is like you've seen this trajectory of uh, actually like levels of gun ownership per household has not increased that much even as the amount of n guns in the U.S. has grown. So like it's, it's basically the households that already own guns just buying more guns. So, you, I'm sorry, so the number of households owning guns has not increased. Right. But the number of guns has, so each household that owns them owns more. Right, it actually might have decreased. The number of households with a gun in, in them uh, has decreased while the number of guns overall has increased. Uh, one piece that you wrote um, looked head on at the, the, to the extent that there is a policy debate and to the extent that there is, there is majority public support on many issues, it is around things like stronger background checks and screening or banning bump stocks, um, which, you know, which you, you describe as, as fundamentally modest approaches compared to measures that, um, you know, in Australia of having gun buybacks, which is essentially confiscatory or, you know, putting a very high tax on the ammunition or what would, what would a aggressive gun policy look like? And where do you see the prospects of that ever? I mean, that, that, this is like where it gets tricky because like when you say aggressive, it, it really just means on how aggressive you're talking about. So like there are like just, there, there's just a range here. If we're talking about uh, like the United Kingdom model, the, you have to justify by, like why you purchase a gun there and you can't just say self-defense. You have to say this is for my job, this is for like something more important than just self-defense. In the U.S., if you tell someone that they can't buy a gun for self-defense, you're immediately going to start running into Second Amendment uh, complaints. Um, the, so, like, that would be aggressive in the U.S., but in the United Kingdom, it's a model they've had for decades and has served them pretty well. They have, like, some of the lowest levels of gun deaths in the developed world. Um, same thing with Japan. In Japan, it's extremely hard to buy a gun. You go through, like, multiple background checks. It, it, the process can literally take months just to buy one gun. In the U.S., again, if you, if you did that, people would be upset. Um, you could also, but if you look within the U.S., I think that's where you can start like seeing what's aggressive and what's not, and like more in a, within a U.S. framework. So, like, I actually think like Massachusetts is one of the like states that uh, I, I've been asking around for about this for a while now, for a story I'm working on, and consistently they point to Massachusetts because it has like all these measures in place that essentially put checks, like the permit to purchase, which is essentially a gun licensing system, extra background checks, more regulations on actual sellers of firearms. And like these are things that still make it so something like 90 plus percent of people who actually try to buy a gun can buy a gun. Um, but the 10 percent, like those are the people who might have like a troubling criminal history or something along those lines that you don't want them to buy a firearm. And it seems like that is what would be considered aggressive in most of the U.S., especially when you compare it to New Hampshire that basically has none of this in place and just does the federal law. Um, and I think that's as far as the U.S. would be willing to go. If you actually poll on like gun licensing and stronger background checks, that stuff has support. But once you start getting into like bans or registries and that kind of thing, then support starts not only dropping but getting far more polarized, which and in, in Congress, you'll presumably need Republican support, at least some Republican support, to pass some of these measures. The, um, as much focus as there's been, especially at a time like this, on, on gun violence and homicide, mass shooting, domestic violence, um, in some ways its most significant impact numerically is suicide. Right. And the, um, the odds that a suicide attempt will be successful, they you know, may not have anything to do with whether someone attempts or not, but they're more likely to succeed if they're, if they're using a gun. And we've seen suicide rates rising dramatically in the country. What, do you see the whole question about mental health, the, the shortages of um, mental health resources, uh, and the significant rise in diseases of despair 
having an impact on the gun debate or not. They're just going to be treated as two separate phenomena. Well, no, I think it's, I think in general, like one of the problems with how we look at gun violence is that it is uh, not just, like we, we tend to focus on these mass shootings, but if you look at the statistics, and I'm not in any way trying to downplay how horrific these are, because like every single time I have to write one of these up, it like breaks my heart seeing these stories, but like they are fewer than 1% of gun deaths in the U.S. If you look at the, the next biggest section would be homicides, like ju just general homicides. Like um, we're talking about like domestic violence and urban violence. Like those are the big categories there. And then suicides is like usually 60% plus of these issues. And like I think it's uh, like I've heard criminal, like uh, gun researchers and experts say this before that we're dealing with like multiple gun issues at once and trying to like lump them in together as one. Um, and that's just, that's not conducive to the, the, to the solutions here because each of these issues will require separate solutions. So on the suicide point, I think it like the deaths of despair, I mean we have seen suicides trend up, we've seen like alcohol deaths trend up, we've seen opioid epidemic get particularly bad, um, and just drug overdose deaths. In fact, like we're seeing also now seeing cocaine and meth deaths go up too. So it's like, th those are usually lumped together as like deaths of despair, but at the same time, with suicide, we do have like solutions specific for gun suicides that seem to help, like waiting periods. Those are very effective for reducing suicides, maybe not so much for reducing like domestic violence or urban violence or mass shootings. Because like people can get those guns, keep them in their house, and then when they decide to uh, do something, they'll like a uh, attack a partner or attack a school or whatever, they, they'll, then they'll like pick up the gun and do it. Whereas suicide's actually surprisingly impulsive. If you look at the uh, data, people decide within typically hours if they want to kill themselves. And then, so that's where a waiting period can play. But like, it's questionable just how much of an impact it'll have in these other areas. Or like if you look at the assault rifle, uh, the assault weapons ban, that might have an effect on mass shootings. We honestly just don't have enough research to know yet. But like whether it would have an effect on like urban and domestic violence or suicides, which are mostly done uh, carried out through handguns, that's like an open question. Um, so it, it, that's one thing that I think we need to unravel with this gun violence. It's like separating out what kind of gun violence we're talking about, and then the, like the solutions will need to be specific to each of those categories. Let me uh, throw open the floor to you to ask questions. And um, I'm actually a, a reporter, and I, I don't cover the gun beat often, but I did do a piece for Politico, so I had partially a statement, but also a bit of a question regarding that last bit about mental illness and gun violence, because um, from what I did in my research for that piece, um, even though women attempt suicide twice as much as men, men have the highest rates of suicide because they're the ones that tend to own the guns more. However, when you tease apart those numbers, um, especially when I looked at certain states, a lot of times half or more than half or were murder suicides, so they were domestic violence incidents. What, while also mass shootings, it seems like more than half or about 54% are actually arising out of domestic violence incidents. So I'm, I'm wondering, one, because I found it very hard to tease apart those suicide rates and how much are murder suicide when it might be just a person and their partner. Because then I'm wondering that it's not just suicide, there is a murder element to it. Um, and also I just wanted to address the gender ratio because my piece was looking at how the vast majority, like virtually all but a couple in the past four decades were men, usually cis men, committing these acts, these mass shootings, as well as a bunch of myriad of smaller domestic violence shootings that occur that usually tend to get overlooked in the news. Like maybe separating, like maybe the, the way I'd, I'd put these categories out there, it's like you're totally dividing them, but they play into each other. Like you just mentioned, I mean like, uh, I think the Huff, Huffington Post is actually the one who did this piece on like mass shootings. Uh, I think they define mass shootings, and this is a whole nother debate is how you define mass shootings, but they define it as four or more people killed, and the majority of those were domestic violence incidents. Um, and it's also true that if you look at, uh, Thomas Out, who's here right now, uh, he pointed out that if you look at suicides and homicides, like the, the risk of suicide as that increases, the risk of homicide also increases in these domestic violence situations. And I think if you, if you put yourself in the mind of that person, they might think like they're already abusive to their spouse. Um, they, they might 
think like there's there's if, if they're going to kill themselves anyway why not like kill their spouse too um, and that like it's like trying to rationalize someone who's doing something horrible there but like it, it, essentially that's what happens here is like once you increase the risk of suicide it increases the risk of homicide and if there's a domestic violence situation if there's a risk of that there's obviously a risk that that whoever's doing that might end up not just killing his spouse but the entire family and and like we've seen this before where they uh, go on actually in Sandy Hook he shot his mom and then went to the school so it's like it often these things just spill over and people seem to go on on rampages a technical question about the Massachusetts gun laws uh, exactly uh, does the police chief have to give a reason for denying a gun permit or can he do it just so the, the way the system works in Massachusetts is like first you go through the normal system the background checks that'll and then the, the mental health check and then that's when the police will be able to use, the police chief will be able to use his discretion so like what the police chief can do at that point like uh, I think the way I talked to a few police chiefs about this and the way that it usually works is if like like, like say I know someone has a uh, like it, it's not on any of the records but I know that he has um, like a like a history of, of, of suicidal thoughts like his wife warns me about that and I'm the police chief I would say no whether I have to give that reason though um, like that you you would eventually if that is appealed because a person who's trying to purchase a gun would appeal it and then the court would ask was the police chief being arbitrary and capricious uh, and if the police chief can't give a good reason then then presumably the court would say okay you did this wrong um, and, and that's that kind of offers a check in the system in general most challenges are thrown out of court because it turns out that the police chief, at least based on the court's understanding, does have a good reason for, for denying, using their discretion to, to deny a permit. And I wonder if you can talk about the politics of the research hold on gun violence that is in, has been in Congress now for whatever, 10, 12 years, and how, what kind of movement there might be on that or interest in changing that. Uh, for those not familiar with this, uh, in the 90s, Congress put a hold on the CDC researching, um, doing studies that would come out affirmatively for gun control. Uh, and the CDC has interpreted this as basically a ban on any research on gun violence. Because if you do research on gun violence, chances are a lot of it will come out in favor of gun control. So it's like a huge risk as a researcher to <laughs> write, work on this study for years. Turns out that your, uh, your conclusion is, hey, this, measure, this gun control measure did work and then Congress would be upset because you're not supposed to use federal resources for that. So there's been a move to, that was supported by the NRA and gun rights groups. They, they really pushed hard for it and they've continued pushing for it. I mean, that's something that we've seen in recent years, the shift like that. Now Congress uh, has taken steps to actually alleviate that, to clarify that they don't want to ban all research on gun violence. And we've actually seen more of a push to just like eliminate this ban altogether. And actually the Republican who originally sponsored this he came out and said, this is not what I intended. If I could, I would take it all back. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we've seen in like, like there might be like a growing bipartisan consensus to just essentially let the CDC do more research on gun violence. Um, I, I can't make a prediction on where it will go, uh, but it, it's definitely, I think if like Democrats got into Congress and uh, like the, in the White House, it might be one of their top priorities because it's like an easy budget item to just slash off. My question is more about from sort of the journalism, social media perspective, is that any time there's a mass shooting or a suicide that gains more media attention, what we see a lot of times is this, the discussion seems to fall into sort of a, a dichotomy of people talking about good people can have guns, but bad people can't have guns. But then this sort of goes back to what you were saying before about how we can't just add all these different problems in and, and have it as a blanket solution to gun violence because we know that there are different policies that may be more effective for suicide, domestic violence, or um, mass shootings. Um, and so my question is, how would you, from a social media or journalism perspective, encourage individuals who are writing or students or on social media to use terms and words that are not just you know, going right into the good guy versus bad guy debate, which then feeds into the extremist opinions on both the left and the right. And like one of the things, too, is just, um, even when we say the word gun control, that immediately implies you're taking away something from someone where it may be more effective to say 
gun violence prevention because that sounds more who doesn't want to, to mm -hmm. reduce gun violence as opposed yeah. to control. So just a thought about, you know, when we write about things and how we say things is from a media perspective. I think uh, the key here is just being more specific with what problem you're speaking to. So I'm, I'm actually, like, in terms of, like, gun control versus gun violence prevention, I'm actually not a big fan of, like, like, in the purpose of, like, a broad talk about this topic, sure, I'll, I'll like, use those terms. But like when we're talking like in, in journalism and talking about specific issues, I think it's important we are specific about which issue of gun violence we're talking about here. So like, I mean, it's really as simple as instead of saying gun deaths, just saying gun homicides or gun suicides or, um, and then like pulling out which like gun homicides you're talking about and just being as specific as possible as to like what the research you're covering or what the issue you're covering is about. And I think, yeah, you're right. That like in general, like on social media, there's definitely a, uh, it's definitely true that people get lost in like vague uh, arguments that like, I mean, how often has everybody, has everybody heard the phrase like, we need common sense gun control. And I have no idea what that means. Like literally no idea. Because like if I ask from person to person what's common sense, it's obviously going to vary. So, and, and you see this in polling too. Um, if you ask people like, do you support strengthening gun laws? Like, you see actually less support for that than if you ask them, do you support stronger background checks? Like, once you start getting specific with policies, you start, like, bridging some of that divide that people have because some of the things that are, like, quote-unquote common sense do actually just start making more sense to people. Like, they, they, they understand that it's not about, like, taking their guns away. It's also about, like, doing X and Y and specifically. Just sort of building on this idea that there are multiple gun problems, and in terms of the lethality, uh, you know, as you mentioned, uh, mass shootings are a fraction of a percent. Uh, in terms of overall homic uh, homicides, suicides are, you know, 10, 15 percent. The, by far the largest uh, percentage of homicides is the urban homicides between and you know, among, you know, young men of color often lacking opportunity. Uh, how do you, how can we sort of uh, raise the profile of those, uh, that type of gun violence that is actually causing many more deaths than these other types without um, sort of diminishing the importance of, uh, obviously, the tremendous importance of the mass shootings as well. So um, I think that that's like an important part of this. And I think actually the March for Our Lives protesters were really good at highlighting this. So a lot of the actual demonstration was focused on getting people on stage and like, talking about not uh, mass shootings, but quote unquote, like everyday shootings. Um, so you saw people come from like, there, there was, I think this was one of the, the videos that went viral from the actual March for Our Lives protest was uh, this little girl, I think she was 11, talking about how her school just sees somebody die from gun violence pretty regularly. Um, and you, you saw a bunch of speakers along that line. And these aren't people dying in mass shootings. These are people just dying in what we would consider urban violence or gang violence or anything along those lines. And uh, I think what what's important, I, I kind of think of like the LGBTQ movement here, like how it brought lesbian, gay, transgender, queer people together. Um, there was, there's not necessarily, they, they're not totally in line with on every issue they do. So like if you look at the, at same-sex marriage, for transgender people, that's still somewhat relevant, but it's not nearly as relevant as it might be to like a gay person. Um, and with, when you look at the transgender military ban that like President Trump is pushing, that's not as relevant to gay people. Don't ask, don't tell, has already been repealed. But you still see the solidarity between these, these groups. And my sense is like there's more work now in gun, gun, like gun activism, gun violence activism, to get these groups together and working together and like speak for each other, let them speak on these issues. So it's not just mass shooting victims talking about this, it's also victims of like urban gun violence or domestic violence or suicides who are joining together and like starting to speak to these issues. And it's like we're not trying to downplay one side's issue or anything like that, it's just that we need to look at this in a comprehensive way. And I think that that's, that's what I've seen as, as most successful and persuasive. I think the risk of, about this question that just asked is that the right has really successfully used the turn of phrase, like, well, what about black on black crime to dismiss police brutality and to dismiss gun violence in other contexts. And so every time anyone tries to have a conversation 
about, you know, preventing gun violence in any form, including violence that comes from the state against disenfranchised people. This has been sort of the out that people are trying to avoid, the conversation has, have used, which is to say like, well, there's this group of people who are like doing this much worse, why aren't we talking about them? And of course the reality is like, those communities have been organizing and talking about and working on those issues for a long time, but people haven't been paying attention to the work that's being done on that. And that also isn't an excuse for, you know, these other forms of violence. And so that's kind of connected to the question I was going to ask. One of the things that I always wonder when we talk about um, gun violence prevention is the question of the police and guns in our society. And I know that's maybe a controversial thing to throw in here, but I think for some communities, when we talk about gun violence, we are sometimes talking about gun violence that's perpetrated by the state against those communities, and that often isn't linked to the conversation um, about gun violence more broadly, and I kind of wonder if you could speak to, um, if you've seen journalists kind of like struggle with that or make connections. I know, for example, police officers have a much higher rate in many studies that I've seen of domestic violence than like the general population, and so if we're connecting you know, murder, suicides, and gun violence to domestic violence, like that should give us concern, you know, so I, I'm just wondering um, about some questions there. So I think there's like two things to look at with that question. One is that, um, like you, you've seen, there are a lot of studies out there that show that where there are more guns and where there's easier access to guns, there's more gun violence. There's actually some research coming out now showing that like where there's more guns and easier access to guns, there's also more police violence too. And the reason for that, like the, the most, charitable explanation of this from the police officer's perspective is if you're a police officer and you know there are more guns in your neighborhood, you're going to be on higher alert all the time. You're going to think that everything is a threat and that's actually going to make you more likely to shoot. Um, and like, so that's like one way that these issues play together and like they are linked. Like it, it's that, that what you were getting at there I think is a good point that these are linked and that they're, they're very important. On the terms of like, I think it's like you mentioned like the, the rebuke of like what about black on black crime First of all, it just totally misses that this, like if you go to any of these communities and talk to them for like literally five minutes, like you, you don't even have to do that much work. Uh, like as a journalist, like I know this, like it, it's just very obvious that they will tell you that yes, gun violence is a problem in their communities and they are trying to do something about it. Um, like it, actually in fact, Chicago has had demonstrations in the past year, multiple demonstrations, marches, that didn't get as much media attention except for locally. Um, basically just saying, hey, we need to do something about the, the gun violence in our cities. That's like overwhelmingly black communities and brown communities coming out and saying like, we need to focus on this. And that doesn't get as much attention on Fox News, so they'll still be saying like, what about black, black on black crime? Next time there's a police shooting to focus on. But I think the other thing that has helped me at least understand this issue better is that I think the issues are related. Like police shootings and the, like the, the violence we see in these communities are related in a way that it's just about lack of trust in the police makes it much harder for police to do their jobs and solve crimes. So if you see more police violence in a community, then what you're going to end up seeing is less trust because this community is going to feel literally under attack. And then when the, a murder happens, like a, a, a shooting of any kind, domestic, gang, whatever, um, the community is going to be less willing to cooperate with those police investigators. And then that murder isn't going to be solved. And, that's gonna, and then that's going to build into the, the system in this way that people are going to think. There's a great book about all this, so it, basically summarizing its ghetto side. It's an extremely good book about, about this issue. But basically it's like once you, you get into that cycle where people no longer trust the police to solve crimes, then they're going to do more, uh, they're going to be more likely to take the law into their own hands essentially. And that inspires, it's kind of like vigilantism. Like if you don't think you can trust the police to keep you safe, then you're going to start well, like, like if somebody shoots your, your brother, your friend, or whatever, then you might think, well, if the police is going to stop that guy, maybe I should. And that might lead to more violence. So I think in that way, I think that's one of the biggest flaws in the what about black on black crime argument, is that it just completely misses that. That these issues are all connected, they are all related to each other, and actually to solve the crime that they're trying to point out to here, the gun violence that they're pointing out to here, you do actually have to improve police relations. You do have to see less like fewer of these shootings, hopefully, to rebuild trust in the community. Um, and 
some of that hits on what, what you said, but I think it's generally right that, that we just overlook how connected these issues are. And um, I covered the Parkland, the aftermath of Parkland. And one of the things that I think gets lost in is what I'm beginning to think it was a big, it was a great anomaly, how the response. It was a Republican legislature, Republican governor. And the, I think one of the reasons why they acted against the odds in 20 months after the Pulse shooting is that they were in session when this happened and it's an election year and there is no way they could have escaped without doing something. They did water down what the gun, you know, opponents wanted to have. But one of, but it also was probably one of the most um, vigorous um, and I think honest debates I'd hear, I'd heard in the Florida legislature in, in, in a very long time. But, but one of the things they did hone in on, and they, they, I think, changed, and I don't know if this is going to have an effect, but I'm wondering if you've watched this happen, if you've watched any, if this has been uh, picked up in other states, is they addressed the mental health piece by giving law enforcement, school officials, more clout and ability to address that on a faster, you know, a faster timeline. Um, and. And you know, it was sort of a hopeful, we hope this will help kind of thing. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, on that, that element of the reform, if other states have done it, and if you think that would make any difference. A bit complicated in that if you look at the mental health side of this in particular, the most mass shootings are not done by people who had previously diagnosed mental health issues. So we can say, Maybe that's because that person was underdiagnosed. Like, I mean, we would like to think that nobody of like sound mind is going to actually carry out one of these horrible shootings. But at the same time, it's also tremendously stigmatizing to people with mental health issues to suggest that they all might be at risk of becoming a mass shooters because the great majority of them, I mean, we're talking like 99 plus percent are not going to carry out a mass shooting. So that, that's one thing. Um, and, and just in general, if you look at the statistics again, like most mass shootings, people were not previously diagnosed. That doesn't mean it can't help. I mean, there's, if you look at the statistics, at the same time, they're still disproportionately represented, people with mental health issues. And particularly when you start looking at like specific il uh, illnesses like depression, uh, that, that sticks out in school shootings in particular. So one thing I've heard before is like, if you take care of these kids for their depression, like you start doing that in your school, you'll treat a bunch of kids with depression and then as a side benefit you might stop some mass shooters and like it, it's like there's no real loss there right like you're in the end you're still giving mental health treatment and that's like something we should perhaps think about as a society more it's like maybe we should do mental health treatment in general better and that might prevent some mass shooters but like in the end it's going to be a small fraction of those people and it's important to not like blame all of them for it because it really does get into I think stigmatizing territory the, the, the last thing is that I think the biggest place where this would have an impact is obviously suicide. And since most gun deaths are suicides, I think that, that would, like, that's where a lot of these mental health measures actually um, make a big impact. I have not seen that many states um, uh, move in the, the direction of like, taking mouth, mental health treatment more seriously, at least to the extent you would like to see. Actually, even with Massachusetts, since I was talking about the gun control laws here earlier, one consistent complaint from police chiefs is that they can pull up records from uh, public hospitals. So like if somebody is put in a public hospital for a mental health issue, the police can pull that up. If somebody goes to a private uh, hospital or a clinic, the police chief cannot see that. There, it runs into privacy concerns. So that's like one way that stifles their ability to like see um, whether this person actually has like a mental health history and, and might be at risk of suicide or some other tragedy. I'm so. from Alaska and lived there for uh, about 60 years now, and um, I, I want to say that you know when it comes to the statistics that you're talking about about domestic violence, gun violence, <coughs> drinking, uh, suicides, etc. I think on a per capita basis we we beat them all. We beat every state. But yet, you know, and I myself own seven seven weapons, each with its own unique purpose. But you know, for hunting and then hunting various types of animals and so forth. But I gotta say that even though we know there's many, there are many, many guns in Alaska, and there is uh, violence there, 
uh, I feel safer there than I do here. Um, and I don't know whether that's just my paranoia at coming from small to big or what, but um, um, it seems to me that, that the balance between gun ownership and gun usage is pretty well balanced there. Uh, you're right, we, we do not have uh, gangs up there. We, most of our violence is not done through organized crime or people trying to do property crimes or whatever. It's mostly alcohol driven and so forth. So I don't know, you know, and gun control up there is an absolute non-issue. You know, anybody brings it up, they don't get attacked too much because everybody says, well, nothing's gonna change, so why should we do it? Why should we even try and why do we need to? Because we've avoided a lot of your problems. But I just wonder whether that factors into people's uh, perception about how big the problem is. Well, I mean, I would push back against some of what you said because it's like you mentioned, you like Alaska does see bigger problems with uh, like domestic violence in particular is something I'm familiar with. And a lot of that is related, as you said, to alcohol. I know that they also have like higher alcohol related health issues in Alaska. Um, but it also might be related to guns. I mean, we see that pretty consistently that where gun ownership is higher, they do have more rates of domestic violence. I think in terms of like one way to, to practically look at it is that in every country in the world, people are going to get into arguments with each other, people are going to fight, but if a gun is around, it's way easier to make that into a, a fatal event, right? Like it, it's just much, much easier. And that's not to say that, that like, uh, like again, going to like Massachusetts example, I think what, like in Alaska, those would definitely not fly politically, like what this, this state has done to, to, but in the end, in Massachusetts, 90 plus plus, 90 plus percent of people who apply for gun permit, they get it. And it's because, in the, if you look at actual gun violence, it is very concentrated, like super concentrated, particularly on like urban violence and, and when we're looking at that, it's, it's a few people doing hor like a lot of horrible things. And I think that's one thing to, to take away from this is that it, we're not talking about like, like we don't have to be talking about literally taking every single person's guns away um, because in the end, not most people with guns are not going to do anything bad with them. I mean, that's just a statistical fact. So I, I think that that's, that's kind of how I look at it, that it's not, like, I think a lot of this has gotten skewed in that, like, like and I know how this would play because I have, like, taught, I have, like, conservative family members and they would definitely immediately push back against, like, the idea of passing stronger gun control laws. And they would say, like, well, I don't want you taking away my guns. And it's, like, it, the debate has gotten skewed in that way because it's really not about taking away people's guns. It's about adding more checks in the system to make sure that the people who do get firearms just don't do anything bad with them. But to the extent that there is, is pushback against even, even what look like very incremental measures, it, it seems as though the concern is a slippery slope that, that once you allow, if you're the NRA, if you're, a, if you're a gun rights group, that once you allow any infringement on the right that you're opening the door to more. Isn't that in a, in a sense legitimate fear in the sense that that um, people who are advocating for the, the sort of introductory more consensually supported measures are, are looking for that to be a first step towards much more constraining ones? Sure, but I mean at the end of the day, like I'm, there are plenty of people out there who support stronger gun laws and uh, would, would support even stronger measures than the ones they're at, proposing in public, right? Like privately they might say, I, I wanna do this that just goes way further than, than what they propose there. But at the same time, you, there, there are like, even in, even in like places like Massachusetts, I mean, it's had this, this gun control system for decades. It's like permit to purchase system has existed for a long time. And the state has not really tried to go much further than that. It hasn't tried to like suddenly do a Australian style mandatory buyback system where it literally confiscates people's guns. Uh, maybe some of that is political, maybe some of that is because there are constitutional concerns, right? Like we have a, a now conservative majority Supreme Court and there's a second amendment has been interpreted to protect individuals right to own firearms. So like that, that would also play into it. So I think like when you're, when you're talking about these concerns, um, I think they're legitimate in that some people do definitely want to go further than they say in public, but there are also political and 
legal restraints in place that will stop anyone from going very far. And just practical. Once you get to like uh, lower levels of gun violence because you do something like what Massachusetts is doing. Like Massachusetts has consistently had the lowest level of gun deaths out of any state in the country for years and years now. I mean, once you get to that point, there's not as much of a push to do more. So, so legislators aren't going to take the risk and do more. It's really just, for them, it, it seems like it's just about adding these checks. And then, if those checks work, they won't have to do more. I just had a question. Uh, so one of my good friends is an executive at MGM. And they're currently facing you know, these massive lawsuits. Uh, that's where the Vegas shooting occurred. And then just, as a, I'm Australian, actually. So you know, the model, hopefully, that you guys can, can take is, is from ours, I hope. But in, 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 without that, um, just being an observer here in America, you know, seeing the solution being proposed, like weaponizing teachers, making schools, and you know, mass concert venues more secure. I'm just kind of understand, like, what is this happening on society now? You know, at the school level or at concerts. I mean, it just seems the culpability is not on the legislation, but on actually like the, you know, the the property owner at MGM or at the school level. It's kind of interested to see what, what what sort of impact that's having on your society. Yeah, I mean, in in uh, I think it was Idaho, and we've seen this in Texas too. There are like schools that are basically turning into bunkers, uh, f for lack of a better term, because they're like taking all these security measures um, that that like like not not just like metal detectors, but like adding more guards all around the school and things like that. And uh, there's there's some good research on that, and I can't speak to it because I'm not as familiar with it as I am with the the gun policy stuff. But like suggesting that that does have a psychological impact on kids. Um, so I think it's not necessarily, I don't know, I, I do wonder how that impacts our society. And at the end of the day, I wonder how, just how effective that is. So like, I, I mean, I just, I came through the airport to get here and uh, there are like plenty of like national security experts that will like tell you that like a lot of it is just security theater and, and whatnot. So I really wonder how effective that is. Uh, at the end of the day, like um, we've seen some of these schools that do have like guards in place and do have like metal detectors, the shooters, like the mass shooters, still manage to go around them. They'll like uh, attack kids in the playground or something like that, uh, and it, it makes me question just how effective these measures is. I get, I think if I had to guess, I would say that they are effective at reducing gun violence to some extent, but they are definitely not addressing like the core problem. And and at the end can come off as just theater and maybe do some damage on the side to these kids psychologically being like literally scared all day about a shooter coming in and, and shooting them. Uh, I would love to be able to have us end on a more hopeful note than that image except we are um, we're living in extraordinary times so instead I'm going to end by reminding you all that it's election day a week from today and uh, everyone should vote and thank you so much for sharing your work, your reporting, your insights with us. Uh, come back next week. There will be pizza. We won't have results, so we can speculate to our <laughs> <laughs>